Aloha. I'm Marcia Joyner, and we are navigating the journey. And today, the journey takes us into the land of the Hawaiian. The Hawaiian Homes Act, the Hawaiian Homes Everything. And our guest is known to all of you that have watched us over the years. And this is my dear friend, Bill Isla, who is now the director of Hawaiian Homes. Is yes, that the correct, is correct title? Mm -hmm. Yes. And the first time Bill was with us was when he was director of Department of, Depart Land, and Natural Resources. Department of Land and Natural Resources, which has been a long time ago. Yes. Yes. <laughs> so welcome, 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 Bill. Thank you so much for always coming when we call. Well, thank you for inviting me. <laughs> so first, tell us about the Hawaiian Homes Act. What is it? Sure. Oh, what? No, it is. It is still in effect. It is still in effect. It okay. is a congressional act um, passed in 1920, implemented, started implementing in 1921, um, by, uh, mainly driven by Prince uh, Kohio, who um, was a non voting member of Congress. Correct, at the time, um, but had a, uh. large, had a large following. Uh, Prince Kohio, um, because of his um, responsibility to Hawaiians and the people of Hawaii saw the uh, degrading of um, conditions for Native Hawaiians as they were dis dispossessed from land. So he went to Congress, took him several years to get Congress to pass uh, the Hawaiian Homes Commission Act, whose primary pur purpose is to put Hawaiians back on lands and secondarily rehabilitate them. Rehabilitate meaning a lot of things because it's pretty broadly described uh, in I the act. Rehabilitate people? Yes. Um, the, you know, the conditions of Native Hawaiians at that time in urban areas, um, you know, they were in um, um, tenements. Is this uh, a plantation era? This is before the plantation era. So this is, well, right at about the, when the plantations were at their, their height. So basically Hawaiians were dispossessed from land. They moved to the urban areas to find jobs. Um, cramped conditions, um, low wages, um, um, disease, um, oh. uh, lots of bad social um, um, indicators if we were to measure them today. So he saw all of this and, and went to Congress to argue for the opportunity for Hawaiians to get back on the land to become uh, farmers and um, ranchers and uh, even aquaculturalists. So aquaculture is actually written into the act. That was oh, kind of interesting. Um, so one of the primary reasons for our being is to get people on the land. There are three different ways. We can do it uh, in a residential lease, an agricultural lease, or a um, pastoral lease. So the department has... Um, What's a pastoral? Pastoral is like a ranch lease. Oh, okay. Uh, because, you know, back then there were very few neighborhood stores and people... Right got their meat from either they raised their own or they went to the, the ranches and purchased cattle. Okay? So over the last uh, almost 100 years, I think, to depend on when you count, either 1920 or 1921, it's either in the, the 99th Nine, year or, or the 100th the, year next year. Yes. Of, um, and we're still discussing about what the proper um, time is to, to, to honor Prince Kohio and everyone that assisted. So we have um, 20... A little over 27,000 people that are still waiting for one of these leases. What takes so long? What takes so long is the cost of developing land in Hawaii. The type of land that we have, some of it is flat, much of it is not. Some of it has water resources, much of it does not. So we spend a lot of time trying to bring water to so where we have So you have to put lands. in, your office has to put in the infrastructure? That is correct. Right. We, we basically pay for um, infrastructure. In the modern world, it's road, sewers, water, electricity. Uh, electricity. Um, in the Shouldn't it be solar instead of electricity? Um, we, we have a program where we allow beneficiaries and lessees to, to install solar to help instead of reduce their costs. Yes. Um, yeah, but I think you know, some people still like that, that comfort of knowing that in case, you know, Something happens, a storm or something, that they have that ability yeah, okay. um, to access uh, Hawaiian Electric. 
<laughs> so in the first, um, I want to say, 40, 50 years of the act, it was a federal act. Yes. Um, and very little federal funds were um, of course. applied. So the department uh, at that time, was its main source of funding was revenue off of leases that were still in effect. So much of, much of the lands that came to DHHL at the time were under lease to sugar companies and big ranches. So as part of the act, it said that we would honor those leases until they ran out. However, payment for these leases was really what paid for the operations of um, the department. So those payments came to you, your Those department. payments came to what to the, the precursor yes. of, uh -huh. of the Department of Hawaiian Homelands. So um, not sure what it was called under the territory, but basically this managing agency. It did the best it could with the resources that it had. It did not have a lot of money allocated for improvements, um, infrastructure, water, and those kinds of things. You fast forward to 1959, Hawaii becomes a state. One of the requirements for Hawaii becoming a state, the federal government says, is you will take responsibility for this program. So since 1959, the department was created um, as a state agency. And a lot of folks, um, a lot of our beneficiaries like to think of themselves as um, um, uh, quasi uh, independent. Uh, however, because we're a state agency, I have to operate under the state rules, regulations, and the federal oversight that has rules and regulations. Mm -hmm. um, so that makes me unpopular with some of our beneficiaries <laughs> who are on the path to, you know, nation within a nation or independent independence, status. Yeah. However, I keep reminding them that I have these rules and regulations that I have to. And then we go to the legislature every year uh, with the governor's assistance to request uh, money. monies. Mm -hmm. uh, the last two years, we've been fairly well blessed. Um, we've got about $25 million in our capital improvement budget for each year. So, so that, the capital improvement is for the infrastructure? That is, that'll help us build infrastructure, right? Okay. So roads, sewers, um, it could go to uh, the development of a well, um, the um, infrastructure to take, to transport that water from that well either to another county system or uh, perhaps to our system, because we manage three water systems. Um, we lose a lot of money on those systems, but it's a necessary, um, necessary benefit, yes. right, to, to our, our homesteaders, especially on Molokai, where a lot of uh, the larger ag lots are. Well, now tell me, this, you have land on each island. Yes, yes. including Lanai, which we just received, I want to say, in the last 15 years. Yes. Nihau? No, no land on Nihau. It's privately owned. Yes. Uh, so, uh, well, okay, now Molokai and that Molokai Ranch for sale, mm -hmm. all of that land mm -hmm. is just sitting there. So do you get to any part of that? Do you get a part of their mm -hmm. lease? No. Molokai Ranch? No. You don't get we anything? No, do not. That's private. I mean, yeah. down the road, if they decide to sell in the state... They, they want to sell, the but state, they... The state were to purchase some of those lands, and it's possible that we could get additional lands. But we have plenty of lands on, on Molokai. Molokai. What we're missing is water to develop yes. those lands. Yeah, water um, on Molokai is yeah. a big so deal. So what's needed on Molokai is another well uh, drilled outside of the current aquifer, because right now we have three straws in that aquifer, and it's um, you know beyond um, sustainable yield right now. So if we had either our the Molokai Ranch or the county dig another well, then we could um, utilize the um, excess allocation to increase water to our beneficiaries. Now, I understand that Molokai Ranch wants to sell the whole thing. And they don't want to divvy it up. Is that true? I've heard that. I, I have not been any of, in any of the negotiations. Mm -hmm. Because that's a lot of land to sell at one time. It is, but I think a foreign company wants to get out of that and invest that money elsewhere. So they need the whole thing. They want to sell it all at once, all at including once. Uh, their, their operations of uh, their water system attached to Molokai Ranch. Oh, my. That's, that's really a big... You could put a lot of people on that land. You, we could, and yes. we could put a lot more people on our land if we just had more water. water. So developing more water is a priority uh, on the island of Molokai for us. Um, 
One of the biggest challenges for me as chair um, is that we have a, a, a certain segment of the beneficiary class that um, wants the department to emphasize more economic development on, on their behalf. Um, and so we have uh, opposition to leasing of lands that are not uh, required for homesteading. Um, that that's ha has always been part of our history. Right. So all of these lands that were leased to the sugar companies and the ranches prior to is what um, basically paid for the operations, uh, the improvements on the homelands prior to it becoming a state so agency. Now that they're gone and the land is, do you, do you still get any residuals from those companies? On, on lands state lands that were formerly leased to sugar oh, okay. and had sugar operations, we're supposed to be getting 30% of the revenue. So let's say somebody built a hotel on lands that were formerly used for sugar, we're supposed to get 30% of those revenues. Are people building hotels on sugar land? I guess on Maui, huh? Uh, it's, it's totally possible. There's oh. actually a hotel on Kauai that uh, came into our inventory as part of the Act 14 settlement. Mm -hmm. So we're basically you know, paying ourselves with the lease rent. Um, and there are other, other uh, leases that were formerly sugar. We're also supposed to get 30% <clears throat> off of any water licenses. And now so, you're saying suppose. Yes. So that, is that all the operative all, words? Suppose. Yes, yes. So all the water licenses. <laughs> you're trying water, to tell me. <laughs> all the water licenses have expired. Uh -huh. um, there's been several court cases about um, about how the new process should occur. Um, it hasn't occurred yet. So no new water licenses have been issued. Um, as long as that's the case, we're not receiving thirty percent of the. Um, revenue off of those water licenses. And then the challenge becomes, in Hawaii, where water is a public trust right. resource, how do you value that water? And uh, that is- You have is to put a dollar, sir? For the value of the for license, the if we're going to collect- No, no, right? no I meant so on the water. We would have to put a value on the license, license. right? Uh -huh. And then collect 30% off of that. Okay. And and that's that's being so discussed that's right court. now. Yes, nobody knows. Well, it's in court. It's in the legislature. It's in many uh, avenues right now, and uh, we haven't answered that question. Okay. Now, how does OHA fit with the, uh, your office, okay, Hawaiian so, Homes? So the uh, Department of Hawaiian Homes um, and the Hawaiian Homeland right. Program was created in 1921. Right. OHA was created in 1978. So how does that, how do they work together or do they? We have um, the same beneficiary class, uh -huh. although OHA expands their beneficiary class to those who have uh, less than 50%. Um, they receive, um, it's supposed to be, 20, you know, the wording is 20% of the revenue off of ceded lands. However, they receive uh, a formula. So they're basically getting about 15.1, 15.2 million per year. Um, and then additional allocations from um, the legislature, in addition to the revenue that they generate off of their, um, uh, let's call it an endowment for now, money that they have for investing. And so that's how OHA is funded. Now, can they build, <clears throat> can they put people on the land that's they, not your land, but some of their land? They could, they and could. I understand that the trustees are looking for it. We've partnered because we share um, beneficiary uh, classes, yes. right? So we've partnered. OHA has committed to funding um, some of the bonds that we um, have, have um, put out there that have led to um, houses being built, roads being built, um, infrastructure being built. So OAS continues to pay $3 million a year to help us pay for those bonds. Oh, great. Now we have to take a break, and we'll be back in just one minute, and then we're going to talk about the elephant in the room, sure. Mauna Kea. <laughs> we'll be right back. Hello, I'm Mufi Hanavan. I want to tell you about a great show that appears on Think Tech Hawaii. It's all about tourism. In fact, we call it Tourism 101, where we talk about the issues and challenges that faces our number one industry throughout the state. We'll have some interesting guests, some very informative dialogue, and allow you an opportunity to maybe learn a little bit more about why this industry is so important for our state. It's been great for us in the past, we need it today, and especially going forward. That's Tourism 101 on Think Tech Hawaii. Mahalo. 
Aloha, my name is Victoria and I'm a host at the Adventures in Small Business. This is a collaboration between U.S. Small Business Administration, Hawaii District Office, and its partners, where we showcase the stories of local entrepreneurs and small businesses, talk about how to start a business, talk about great tips for small business owners. Uh, please join us every Thursday, 11 a.m. at Think Tech Hawaii. Um, see you soon. Mahalo. I'm Marcia, and we're back. And we are talking with my dear friend, and all of you know I only talk to dear friends, <laughs> with Bill Isla. And Bill is the director of Hawaiian Homes, and he was the director of Land yeah, and Natural Resources, and a whole lot of other stuff. Yes. yes. Now, while you were Land and Natural Resources, the thing of the telescope came up. So let's start there. Sure. And let's see what that impact on the Hawaiians is or has been or will be. Let's, let's start there. Sure. So the conditional use permit uh, to construct in a conservation district, the telescope uh, came before um, the Board of Land and Natural Resources <clears throat> while I was the chair. Yeah. Um, after undergoing an environmental impact statement, many uh, different management plans, many different studies. And the board voted um, to approve the CDUP per, um, permit at the time. There was a question of whether the board, <coughs> excuse me, could make that decision without taking into account a request for a contested case hearing prior to making the decision. That was challenged. <clears throat> Ultimately, that was taken all the way to the, uh, to the Hawaii Supreme Court, and they ruled against basically the board's decision. Subsequently, under new chair, uh, the whole process started all over again. That decision um, was affirmed, and uh, through many different um, appeals, the uh, permit process again went all the way up to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court ruled that Yes, indeed, um, the University of Hawaii TMT followed the law, and therefore TMT should be allowed to proceed. <clears throat> and that brings us to the present day okay. situation where there are some, uh, some folks um, on the road blocking um, the, uh, the movement of, of equipment up, mm -hmm. up to the mountain to begin the construction. Well, it seems to me in listening that most people don't know that it went all the way to the Supreme Court. Most people don't have a sense of the background of what has gone on these 10 years prior to this. And listening to what's going on, there doesn't seem to be anyone that the mountain, the management of the mountain or anything, that take, will come to the microphone and explain all of this. So people around the world have no concept. Of, it's almost like one day there's a telescope and now these people are protesting and saying, you know, and, and well, you know, I come from a long line of protesters, so that's not an issue. Yes. But, but if we don't know the full background, then what they're asking for does not have any meaning. You that know. We need to know. So. I think there's been a change in how uh, people gather information, and with the um, you know with the um, um, pre prevalence, if you will, of social media, um, uh, there are many many thoughts uh, out there on social media about things, and it's right. very difficult to it is. as you know as you and I would do in the past, do our homework and. <laughs> and study something uh, very intently before making a, a decision, right? So many folks make up their minds based on what they see on social media uh, without uh, doing the full sort of uh, analysis. And that's, that's where we are today. Um, particularly for me, um, what I've been accused of lately as the chair of the Department of Hawaiian Homelands in, is um, not uh, practicing my fiduciary duty 
um, as the uh, as as a, as a fiduciary for the advocating for the road uh, Mauna Kea Access Road, and you know we've done the research. We are obtaining um, advice, of course, the Attorney General's office. And back in 1994, 1995, the legislature, as part of a, a larger um, settlement with the past bad practices of removing and using without permission Hawaiian homelands uh, created the, the settlement in uh, Act 14. So Act 14 gave the department a little more than $600 million for past um, uh, unauthorized use of, of Department of Hawaiian homelands. It required DLNR to put back another 16,000 plus acres into our inventory, to, our land inventory to make it whole. Um, and then there, there's a small settlement on Kauai issues, and then there was some um, money that was charged for a school in Nanakuli uh, being on homelands and not compensating for, and a couple of other small things. So in, with that act in 1994, 1995, it settled all of these claims. It, the legislature knew that it was going to take a while to get through the compensation part. So they basically said that by initiating this settlement, um, the Department of Transportation has operational uh, authority, jurisdiction over the road, um, Mauna Kea Access Road, actually. So I have beneficiaries who don't like that, and um, they're uh, promoting another, another view. However, as I'm advised by, I'm a state agency, advised by state attorneys, <clears throat> Um, Act, you know, Act 14 settled this. So this, this is um, something that's been actively debated, uh, I think, on the mountain by um, beneficiaries and non-beneficiaries who um, don't agree that the Department of Transportation has the road and has the authority to close the road. And so this is uh, actually causing a, a lot of discomfort in, in my community and actually um, uh, showing his face in, in some of the Hawaiian Homes Commission meetings and taking up a lot of time away from actually trying to get more people on the land. So that it's just for your department, it's the road. But as big as the mountain is, there are sacred places, I'm sure. But, of course. But all of these other telescopes are there. What about that? Because they're not on Hawaiian homelands? I, I don't have a... No, I meant but, say on that. But That's, in terms of the protest, it seems to be only geared to one telescope and not the others. I think depending what? on who you talk to that are that that are occupying the road right now on the mountain, they all have feelings about whether it's one telescope or all the rest all of the of telescope. Them. Yeah. I would just point out that, you know, Mauna Kea Access Road represents about sixty seven acres of more than three hundred acres of roads and highways that um, either the counties or the state use without our permission. And that's part of the settlement. So it's part of a larger discussion about all the roads across Hawaii that uh, either the state or the county use without our permission. Oh boy. So how, is there, is there, I know this is asking a lot, a way to settle this uh, amicably so that the people that are protesting, the people that want a sacred place on the mountain can have a sacred place without it, without this uh, doing away with the telescope. Is, as big as the mountain is, uh, can't there be sacred places? I, I, I believe the answer is yes. Um, and the mayor of Hawaii Island, Mayor Harry Kim, and the governor are open to any types of suggestions or um, negotiations on how to achieve just that. Because that, that seems to me, I, I, I can't see that the telescope is either or. I just can't believe as big as that mountain is, <laughs> that it's an either or. And that's something that's you know, being discussed as, as, we, you know, as time goes by, right? Yeah. The mayor has held uh, probably about three or four meetings, and I don't know how many individual meetings to try to accomplish just that. Um, so I don't know that he's been successful as of yet, but he's still trying. He's, oh, bless him. My goodness, can you imagine last year with the volcano and now this? He has 
been through so much. Well, Mayor Kim has a lot of experience, so. But how much can his heart take? <laughs> <Really>? <laughs> you know what? He still rides his bike six miles a day. Yes, I know. He, he's, he's, <laughs> such, he's such a tre treasure, a real treasure. And uh, I, I just have to know that this is going to settle. There's got to be a settlement for both sides. I mean, I, it can't I, be either or. I have to believe everybody is praying for that. Yeah, it, it, it just can't be either or. And um, my view, of course, and you were, when I met you, a man of the sea, a man of the ocean, the Hawaiians were traveling around the world guided by the stars when the Europeans thought they'd fall off the edge. They had been so far out in advance of everybody else on the planet. And so for me, the telescope is just further that knowledge. It just furthers that knowledge. So I can't see that it has to go away. I, I, I just think that they, they belong together. It's, it's more knowledge. It takes the Hawaiians even further ahead of the rest. They should be ahead of the world. The Hawaiians should be well, at the top of the world. Polynesian Voyaging Society, but just yeah. less than a year ago, got back from a worldwide right. voyage, yes. right? Carrying the message of we, exactly need, to that. we yes. need to protect our canoe, the planet Earth. And yes. so I like to think that there are cooler heads that you know, are thinking about um, how everybody benefits and how the children of, of Hawaii benefits going forward. Yes. Well, well thank you. Thank You're you welcome. for coming. Thank you for spending this time with me, and you will be back. Sure. You too. Aloha. Thank you all for coming and spending this time with us, and we'll see you next time.